Welcome, everyone, to History Gone Wilder, part of How History Will Travel. I'm your host, the Wilder historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder, and after a large attack by Union troops at Resaca, both Sherman and Johnston reconfigured their battle lines and prepared for more action. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already. Join the Patreon page and purchase something from the Teespring store or Etsy shop. Every little bit helps. Thank you. So far, Joseph E. Johnston had held off William T. Sherman's attacks along his line and even launched an offensive himself against the exposed Union left flank. But that was thrown back by Joseph Hooker's 20th Corps. At about the same time that Stevenson's division was fighting on the Confederate right, another major attack was taking place on the Union right flank. James McPherson and Corps Commander John A. Logan could hear the rattle of musketry and the roar of cannons on the left flank and wanted to prevent Leonidas Polk in their front from sending troops to aid the Confederate right flank. Plus, there were some hills in their front that if captured would allow Union forces to batter the Confederate entrenchments, the railroad, and the town of Resaca. At 6 p.m., a bugle rang out, and Logan's men stepped off toward the Confederate works. The men of the 15th Corps nobly dashed through a hailstorm of lead and iron, which belched forth from the enemy batteries and rifle pits. Reaching the base of the hill, they climbed the slope, and, running over the crest of the first undulation in the eminence, fairly affected lodgment under cover of a dip in the plateau. The hurrah of thousands of admiring friends followed the onward march of this command. The overwhelming numbers were too much for the rebels, and they broke, being swept from the field and driven to the west toward the second set of entrenchments. There were some brave spirits in both regiments who continued to pour it into the enemy from behind trees while the Federals occupied the crest of the ridge. We stopped all the men we could and put them into our line. I said to one fellow, Halt, what are you running for? He answered, Because I can't fly. The attack allowed the Federal soldiers to gain the upper hand by capturing the hills from which they could pour artillery fire into the town. Polk realized the precarious situation and organized his men for a counterattack. His troops advanced toward the Union soldiers, now using the rebels' own works against them. One Union soldier remembered, These dispositions were scarcely made when our skirmishers were driven in, followed closely by the enemy, who had massed a large force in our front and seemed determined to retake the position at all hazards. Colonel Americus Rice, 57th Ohio, in whose immediate front they were advancing in column by regiments, opened a murderous fire by rank and with deadly effect. Other portions of the line on the left also delivered a well-directed fire on their flank, notwithstanding which they advanced within thirty yards of our line before they were checked, and then only fallen back to reform and renew the attack, threatening my right flank. They were again repulsed and again rallied for another onset. By 8 p.m., Polk abandoned his attempt to regain the former works in the hills, and he recalled his men. The attacks launched by Logan and McPherson threatened to cut the Confederate army off from the south, Johnston's back was already against a river, and now his left or southern flank was threatened to be turned. He would be completely surrounded if the Union soldiers broke through on Polk's flank. Sherman didn't take advantage of this precarious situation. Instead, he ordered his troops to dig in. Johnston seemed unaware of the problems that Logan posed on his left flank, and instead ordered a daybreak attack on the Union left flank. But the time of the attack was changed to noon, but Carter Stevenson and Alexander Stewart didn't receive their orders until 3 p.m. It was determined for the two divisions to launch their attack at 4 p.m. On the other side, Sherman also ordered an attack around 4 p.m. A series of miscommunications led to a flailing attack by the rebels. Confederate Major General William H.T. Walker was south of Resaca guarding the crossings of the Ustanala River. He detected Union troops moving across at Lay's Ferry and reported it to Johnston. In reality, it was just one division from Grenville Dodge's corps, but Walker surmised that it would be a major movement by the entire Union Army. Johnston got worried and called off the attack, but word couldn't reach Stevenson and Stewart before they launched their assault. In reality, only Stewart attacked. Stevenson believed he was simply ordered to support Stewart, not launch his own assault. Either way, Joseph Hooker's 20th Corps collided with the rebel division in their own attack, driving Stewart's men back to their entrenchments. Behind their dug-in position, the Confederates played havoc on the approaching Federals, but some of the blue troops got close enough to the entrenchments to make the rebel artillery ineffective, and they dug in close to the rebel works. As the sun began to set, Union troops got to work attempting to capture the four-gun battery 
in their front. One soldier who took part in the event remembered, as soon as night had fallen, a strong detachment of determined men crept silently under the little fort and began removing the earth, logs, and stones of which it was constructed. Their work was overheard by the vigilant enemy, and a sharp engagement followed, which lighted up the whole crest of the hill. But while their comrades fought, these sappers and miners continued their work, and near midnight, when all was ready, a sudden dash was made, the drag ropes made fast, and with a burst of cheers and laughter, the four guns were sent trundling down the hill to the rear of the Union lines. Hooker's attack failed, other than capturing the battery. During the night, Johnston contemplated what to do next. If Walker's report was true, then the Union army would soon cut him off from Atlanta. That was too great of a risk for Johnston, and he pulled his army out of the entrenchments around Resaca on the night of May 15th and headed toward Adairsville. At Resaca, Sherman lost about 2,700 troops, and Johnston lost about 2,800 soldiers, a total of about 5,500 casualties. Johnston at first thought he could defend the valley the town of Adairsville sat in, but his army couldn't occupy the needed space to prevent Sherman from moving down the valley. Union forces moved down toward Adairsville and prepared to attack Johnston's position, but Johnston had other plans. He moved William Hardy's corps down the railroad and moved John Bell Hood and Leonidas Polk's corps down a road leading from Adairsville to Cassville. Johnston wagered that Sherman would divide his force to come after the rebel army, and when he did, two of Johnston's corps would defeat one contingent in detail. Just as Johnston believed, Sherman separated his force and moved south. Hooker's 20th Corps, along with John Schofield's 23rd Corps, moved on the eastern flank. The 4th and 14th Corps, under George Thomas, moved down the railroad, and McPherson's two corps swung to the west. Johnston concentrated his forces near Cassville, with Hood on the right facing west, Polk blocking the road to Cassville, and Hardy on the left watching the road from Kingston. On May 19th, Sherman's columns continued their march toward the Confederate position, and as Schofield and Hooker came down the road, Hood's corps swung to the left to attack them in the flank. But when Hood formed his men, he detected Union troops on his right flank and possibly behind him. Although Johnston would protest that no troops were on his flank, Federal cavalry were on the flank in heavy numbers to protect the two Union corps. With no attack possible, Johnston pulled his army back to Cassville and occupied a ridge outside of the town. Union guns were trained on the Confederate position and delivered destructive volleys into the rebel ranks. It became so untenable that both Hood and Polk requested to move farther south or allow them to launch an attack. Johnston authorized the retreat. The Confederate Army's morale plummeted as they constantly retreated. A Confederate officer wrote to his wife around this time that, I've seen so much beautiful country given up to the enemy as to be made unhappy by it. You cannot imagine how disheartening it is, and at the same time humiliating, to see the apprehension of the people of a country abandoned to the enemy. I had rather have the agony of defeat as far as my own feelings are concerned. The officer who wrote that letter was Joseph E. Johnston. <laughs>